From We Are Spectacular, this is a Spectacular Marketing Podcast. A podcast about everything brand, marketing, digital and social for the food and drink industry and beyond. So today I'm in Radio Reverb, which is in the open market just off London Road in Brighton. And it's a fabulous, busy and buzzy place with lots of things to look at as we were recording the podcast today. Today's episode is with the founder of Lingua Brand, Mr. Alistair Herbert. And Alistair is one of the best, most world-class tone of voice and listening experts that I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Alistair doesn't just create tones of voice for brands, he also is an expert in listening to their rivals and figuring out where you can gain the best brand advantage that you can possibly get. Alistair creates great tones of voice that customers love to hear. So let's get straight into it and I hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, it gives me great, great pleasure today to welcome one of life's amazing human beings um, into what is actually a proper recording studio for once called Radio (laughs) Reverb down in Brighton at the open market. They've kindly lent us their space and their microphone, so thanks for that. So please let me introduce you to the wonderful, glamorous, amazing... Alistair Herbert. Uh, uh, that's uh, nice not to hear uh, understatement. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Mark. It's good to be here. <laughs> I'm nothing if not honest. Now, <laughs> Alistair for me is, you know, just a real inspiration in terms of the knowledge, the professionalism, the dedication to his art form. And he really is the best that I've ever met in terms of tone of voice for brands. So, what do we term you as the founder of Lingua Brand? Yeah, I, I tend to say founder. Uh-huh. That, that means we're that means we're still small. <laughs> <laughs> we, when we get to managing director, that's uh, that, that's when we got big. But actually, you know, we we like we like the size we are. Nice. So you first came into my life, our uh, what? Through a year and a half, two years ago, maybe. Yeah, I, like think, may, I think it was maybe maybe three years ago. We had a we were we were introduced and um, by a mutual friend, and we caught up and had coffee. Yeah, and um, and discovered all. I, I was really fascinated to discover all of the work that you were doing in food and drink. And interestingly, we'd never worked in food and drink at that stage. You know, mm. our focus had been in healthcare, financial services. You know, areas where people didn't have a product and all they had was their voice. Yeah. Um, and these 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 are, were markets that are quite easy to get into because financial services, you know, have desperate trouble differentiating themselves, and it's an area that uh, that I'd personally worked in. And um, you know, healthcare. One of the great things about healthcare is they are massive buyers of evidence. You yeah. know, they are scientifically driven. So our metrics-driven approach to, to language was really attractive to them. So I was really interested meeting you and discovering all the work you'd done with Yosushi and, and, and the specialisation that you had with We Are Spectacular. And, you know, and here we are now, yep. today, fortunately, yep. over the last few weeks, you know, we've been working in food and drink. We are working right now on... Uh, understanding whiskey markets and mm-hmm. what's the difference about Scotch uh, single malts versus blend versus bourbons, and we're doing that by listening to a whole market and all of the rivals and the way that they're talking to understand what their personalities are, what their propositions are, yeah. and the underlying psychology of, 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 of the persuasion frames that they use. And also, we're working with breakfast cereal on the other side, which is listening to the consumers. Yeah. So, so not whiskey for breakfast. Not whiskey for breakfast. <laughs> what was bizarre, we had a debrief mm-hmm. on, on two days in a row. And uh-huh. the first debrief was whiskey in the morning. And Ooh. the second debrief was breakfast in the afternoon. Well, I used to have Frosties at night. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they sold it to me well that you could should have more cereal. You used to eat it with chopsticks as well. So maybe that was a, a lead into to sushi eventually in my, my later life. But also, I think what really excited me when we first met was... A, you wanted to go for a beer. I was up for that. Second thing was, you just bamboozled me, right? When we first met, I was like, this is way above my pay grade or my intelligence. What's going on here? And when you explained what you did, 
I, I didn't. It didn't quite click because tone of voice to me was quite basic. And now I'm so glad that I'm so much more aware of you know how high up uh, an important a thing it can be for brand strategy. And back then it was a neat copy line, and it was you know some lines on packaging or something like this, you right. know, or free pens in Barclays Bank where you know where, where the where the pens were to give it a bit mm-hmm. of, and when you you just opened this door and I was like, oh my god, there's no going back from this. Well, now. I'm really pleased, but I mean, <laughs> I, I I think we we've moved on because you've mm-hmm. pointed out that there's an issue there about explaining things. So we've we've really sort of re pitched what we do away from voice to listening Mm. um, and that's the area that we want to own so we're actually saying it's much more about listening and understanding how people are talking and the psychology behind that and then understanding a brand and the brand's personality and then understanding the rivals and and the context Mm. that your that your tone of voice and your personality has to sit in so I mean, one of the great pieces that really got me totally into this was originally that we only had words to compete with when I was a marketing director of a financial services company. And so then we were just very much looking at things like, you know, what are we offering? What are the propositions? What's generic? What's making us different? And we there was quite some simple technology to enable you to do that. And then we wanted to answer a big question. And that big question was, what exactly is brand differentiation? Mm -hmm. And I think we in marketing use terms. It was interesting listening to to your podcast with Robert Bean. Mm -hmm. And and Robert's very much of the same ilk going, well, as marketing people, we don't seem to understand our own terminology. I mean, ask a marketing person what marketing is. And you ask 10 marketing people, you get 10 answers. Mm -hmm. So... I think we need to be very much better at understanding what these things are. And so we, when when we started and looking at what brand differentiation was, it struck me as being blindingly obvious that it, you have to ask you have to ask yourself a question there which is different from what. Mm. And that means different from your rivals because Essentially, we see business as a relationship where you're trying to make relationships. It's not complicated. You know, as we as we move through our careers, we sort of unlearn a lot of things that we learned, but we had to learn those to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my take on on business is that it's just about making and maintaining relationships, be those with customers, your talent, your investors or your partners. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. So the. What's really important in relationships? Looks tend to attract. Think about your own relationships and Mm. and what maintains those relationships are the conversations. So I think that's a really good point, though, if if you draw the analogy across to real life and romance and all these things, that most people are a bit shallow. (laughs) So it might be the look of something at first. It could be before you get to know someone. Yeah. And then, well, looks attract, and that and that's not a sexual thing either. Yeah. You know, we're attracted to people that look good, which is why yeah. you and I are sitting here, Mark, because <laughs> you've always been a looker, a magnet, a oh, yeah, <laughs> face for radio. So I think, um, yeah. So and and then going deeper into relationship, it is about how you sound, how you communicate, how you engage, how you. So that's a really good. Th- Thought. Yeah, and what's under, what's what was really striking is when we we realised that the answers didn't lie in linguistics, the answers lay in psychology. And when we started to understand and investigate the work that psychologists had done, it suddenly became obvious mm-hmm. that the vast majority of our communication is received subconsciously. People are already getting into the idea of system one versus system two thinking. What's what's that? Then? Um, this is, this is um, the sort of neuroscience of how the brain deals with information um, and what we're aware of and what we're unaware of. So system one thinking is something that was introduced by a guy called Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast, thinking slow. I'm sure many of your listeners will be very aware of, of that book mm-hmm. interestingly 
he's framing thinking as a machine, <laughs> which I'm not sure it is. We tend to think of, uh, of, of thinking being much more embodied. But system one thinking is the stuff that, that is going on behind the scenes. You know, we've got our, the front of our brain is system two. This is our rational, logical brain. And it acts like a big gorilla, keeping information that we're receiving all the time, the sensory stimuli that we're receiving all the time. Mm. It's the doorman just stopping us from going crazy by being aware of absolutely everything that's going on and everything that our senses are feeling. But mm. we, are, we, are, we are receiving all of those sensory stimuli all of the time and only a maximum, a very maximum, people like Lakoff and Johnson are saying, look, it's only a total maximum of about 5% are we actually aware of. Mm. And, of course, what we're acting on is our deeper emotional um, responses. So yeah. system one thinking is basically about our subconscious and our emotions and the things that are driving us and, and helping us make decisions. Yeah. Um, which of course we then rationalise and say, oh well we, you know, you, 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 you know, I, I bought this for these reasons. And this yeah. is why so much market research is so poor. Because if you ask people why they do things, they'll give you a logical answer. Yeah. But the reality is we don't know why we do things. Yeah. So we specialise in research and listening to those deeper psychological elements that are contained in language. Because mm-hmm. language is fundamentally connected mm-hmm. to us, the way we think, of our perspectives on the world. So if you listen deeply enough... People are telling you exactly what you need to know to sell to them better. Mm. So wh- where can you listen? I know it's a bit of a odd question, but, you know, in terms of some tips for, for, for people listening, wh- where do you go about listening? Wh- you know, what are all of the areas? Where do you start? Well, people are talking all the time mm. and people are talking more and more and more and that's because of our digital world mm. so people are expressing their opinions all the time um but they're also expressing a way that they're framing those opinions their attitudes mm. and their emotions within those so they are difficult to understand if you don't have some knowledge of how to get beneath it but It's also really important to spend time listening, not talking to people, Mm -hmm. not framing questions that are going to get you answers you want back. So you can listen to people on social and you can go into some depth about, you know, try to get under, understand how the sort of the frames they're putting together. You know, are they talking about this thing as a battle? Are they talking about it as a journey? Are they, you know, these deeper ideas? Yeah. And the other thing is really important and often overlooked is to understand where your rivals are. Because if you're trying to get a relationship going with a customer and always think about one customer, you know, Mm. that one person or, you know, a number of people that represent different types of customers that you've Mm. got, then you need to understand that other people are trying to have relationships with them as well. And so what are they hearing? Yeah. You know, it's very easy for us to to become centred on our own brand and our own communications and not to understand what what else they're listening to. So the one thing I would say to to your listeners is exactly that. Practice listening Mm. listen to your friends listen to your partner actively listen and that means like you're doing now you're Mm. nodding at me you're giving me affirmatives you're saying carry on talking okay and you can do this and you can do that Uh uh-huh yeah okay and i I, there's a great example of how we stop people um we stop listening if people say Oh, me, me, and me and Lynn are going on holiday next week. What do people say straight away? Where are you going? Where are you going? And they say, Oh, oh, well, we're going to, uh, we're going to Morocco. And then, Oh, I went to Morocco. I've been to Morocco. And, yeah. do, and then you start talking, and maybe, mm. maybe you go, oh, Okay, yeah. Or why are you going? Or, yeah. That's interesting. Why you know? are you going? Yeah. And if, and oh, because because we've we've you know we've had a few problems and we think we want to get some time away. Mm. Okay, now you're starting to listen. Mm. Okay, and this is the deal: you cannot listen 
when you're talking. Yeah. So but I'm just going to shut up for a second. <laughs> well, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, back when I was a wee boy, you know, I got a lot of sales training. I used to work in insurance. And a lot of that, yeah, was about listening, definitely. But the trick they always taught us was people love talking about themselves. So when you were in a situation with a broker or something like that, right. you were in a mode where you were fact-finding. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, you flipped it to just always be in that mode. And, you know, I'm always really self-aware about, like, I'm a talker, you know, you know yourself. And, you know, I think you are the same a lot too. So this might be two hours. But, um, but you know, in terms of that, I think that's a, that's a hard thing not to jump into action like you just said. And I think also the selfishness of marketers, me included, is to just say, that's my customer, that's what we're going to tell them. And you don't think about these other people that are asking your customer out on a date if we want to keep that analogy running. And that's fascinating to actually go, right, actually, if I am Café Rouge, then who else is fighting for their pocket and and their bum on seat and all that stuff? What are they hearing? And actually, the big advantage is you going for the clear blue Into the clear space. space, Absolutely. And you say, so so, so you've got to understand what those generics are. What Mm. are the generic propositions? What's the generic personality, the tone of voice? And what are the generic persuasion frames? You know, what's the deeper thinking? Mm. How are they how are they pitching this? I mean, we've just finished a big piece of work on online education in the States. You know, and you've got we, we use these three these examples of these three universities. One one's going building your future. Okay, mm. so you're going, all right, so does this person that you've got on the front of your website, do they actually believe that education is a structure? If they do, you've got it right. Mm. Okay. And then how many other universities are, are saying that? And then we've got one saying... Every university is saying that, right? Yeah, and, and you, so you're going... <sighs> but then you've got to pick... Then you've got one. And this isn't just about language. You know, you get mm. this right. This drives the, all of your communications. If you get the personality and the, and the framing right, it actually drives the visuals. Mm. We, well, the most persuasive language is actually picture words. So, you know, people picture the building. If you talk about the foundations, the structures, the... The cornerstones, you know, that doesn't that goes straight into your system one thinking. You don't mm. have to think about those things. That's why that's so. That's why this sort of metaphorical language is the basis of persuasion because we're sharing yeah. our our pictures with people, and they're really really easy to consume. So so words and pictures are actually one in the same thing and come together. So we've never been a big believer in this, a picture paints a thousand words and then somebody says, well, a word a word speaks a thousand pictures. And so if I said heaven, mm-hmm. you know, or hell or something. But I find those sorts of arguments rather childish because what we've got to do as marketers is bring all of the senses that we've got to communicate yeah. everything that we have to offer mm-hmm to attract people to have a relationship with us and stay with us. Yep. You know, that that's the deal. So a multi-sensory experience will always outperform a single-sensory experience. But when we're online and we're dealing with, with, um, with a user experience, we've only really got two senses that we can use, and that's our voice, you know, what we're saying and what we're writing, which is pretty much the same thing because you're hearing mm. in, when, the voice when, when you're reading writing, and then what we look like. So... It becomes even more important. And so it's extraordinary that so many brands treat their language so trivially. Yeah. You know, and they, they, the, that model of the copywriting, the copywriting model has, has barely changed in 60 years. Yeah. You know, the typewriters changed for the laptop. You know, the pipe might have changed for a vape. Yeah. But it's still being handled in a really sort of trivial way. You know, it's that you get this sort of pony. We work for a supermarket, for one of the very big supermarkets in this country, and they said, oh, we've got to get ponytail. We're going to get the ponytails in. And this was for writing the chairman's, the new, the, sorry, the new chief executive strategy document. And we said, get it to us. We really, really need to understand how this is structured and, and what the persuasion is. But they got it. They got the ponytails to write it and then they put it out and it was received somewhat lukewarmly. And we analysed para- paragraph by paragraph mm. how persuasive this was. And two-thirds of the way through this document, the persuasion level fell by 27%. Wow. 
And we're going, okay, so what's responsible for the fall off in persuasion levels? And the reason was is that he was highly persuasive for the first two thirds in explaining what the problems were. Mm -hmm. But when he came to saying what that organisation was going to do about it, he was not as persuasive. And that's something that we could have solved for them. Was that because he wasn't as clear because it was tied it was up in copywriting? It, it was because he... It, Yes, I think it was it was a ref, it was a reflection of his own thinking. It was a it was a fact that he his advisors were unable to understand the psychology of what persuasion is. So he was using fewer picture words. Mm. You know, he was using f fewer words that were, pers were were based around persuasion. So is that like selling the dream a bit more, or selling the? Yeah, it's about it's about how. I mean, if perhaps I explain a little about what the what these picture words are. These picture words are uh, are 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 the ways our brain wire up to describe one thing in terms of another. Mm. When we're small, we start to all of our we, we experience the world through our senses, and we we wire up and start to explain the world around us mm -hmm. in terms of 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 describing one thing in terms of another. If your listeners are interested, the, the, the seminal work here is Lakoff and Johnson, Metaphors We Live By, written in 1980. And, you know, metaphors used to be thought of as used use by poets and politicians to give us flowery language. But actually, they are a fundamental part of what we are, of how we communicate. I'm just using one there, a part of, right? That means it's connected. There's another one. You know, we, we, we use six to eight of them a minute when we speak. And we use, we use about 12 a minute when we write. And they are, it's the language that enables us to, to talk about pictures. And they're, and they're based around physiology. So let me give you some examples. We talk about growing up, being raised, you know, are you up for that idea or are you feeling a bit down about it? You know, when people are low or down, you know, this we use these we use this sort of positional picture mm. language all the time to describe whether somebody is is being positive or negative. Yep. We we use you know, and that's because when we're small, we look up to our parents. Yeah. And this affects our behaviours. You will earn more money as a busker at the top of an escalator because people feel more positive when they go up. No way. Absolutely. This is <laughs> fundamentally based around, you know, our, about completely how we behave. It's extraordinary. And, you know, we talk about, you know, now you're pretty hot, you know, and, and you've been warming to, since we've met, you've been warming to the ideas that, that, we've, been, that we've been talking about. A lot of people you know, don't want, might be feeling a bit cold about these ideas, mm. right? Now, where does that come from? That is attraction, is about warmth. When we're children and we're babies, when we're held, we are, we are, kept, we are warm. And when we're put down, we cool down. So a lot of these things are actually based around, you know, us, uh, our physiological feelings. Yeah. And we've identified 72 frames about how people frame stuff and they and they fit into some bigger areas like journeys and change states transformation revolution evolution you know those spatial things we've been talking about um there there are connections whether people are together or apart or whether uh, it's a container mm. are you inside or are you outside is the boundary you know so we've identified all of these to enable us to understand how people are framing and thinking about the world around you and this is the basis of persuasion back to that building for the for the for education and we we all talk about brand building don't we is our brand structures you know i'm not sure that they are but we use that language mm. because our customers use it so it's if you understand how people want you to persuade them mm. then it becomes a lot easier and if you put a personality with that, and you can change that those persuasion yeah. frames. You know, you asked or, whether on the prep for this, you you sent this question saying, could you change your tone of voice, and can that develop? Well, we're thinking about propositions, the things that you're offering. This is all front of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so what what do you what are you offering people? We measure those things, and then this deeper thing about persuasion, and in the middle is personality. And my immediate reaction was, yeah, yeah, of course you can, but actually, I think the personality part is where a brand should be pretty well consistent about mm. who they are. I mean, think about yourself. Do you change your personality? Not anymore. 
Yeah, I, I think in some jobs are dead because yeah. you had to. You had to sort of toe the line. Um, mm-hmm. The really interesting discussion with someone who was working for a big corporate and yeah, they sort of leave their soul at the door and go in and do their bit and come away again in our, a party animal outside. So I think you have to temper it for mm-hmm. some organisations, which yeah. isn't a nice place to be because you just want to be yourself all the time, it's a lot less exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, unfortunately, yeah, you've, you've got to but as a brand, conform. But as a brand, mm. if a brand is conforming, as many of them do, mm. they are simply being a commodity. Yeah. And this is the deal, I think, that... And the wh- same into that job analogy as well. You're replaceable if you're not bringing you. If you're not bringing extra, your personality and... You're an order taker. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a bad place yeah, for you to be. You're, you're not delivering at your best, and, yeah. and brands need to deliver at their best, and and that person and their personality, I think, needs to be consistent. That you know, we find this thing all the time where people go, "Hey, it's social media. That's where we do it a little. That's where we go a bit crazy. You know, mm. you know, that's where we start because that's what that's the way people want to be spoken to on social media. But on on our website or in store or in the restaurant, you know, we're going to be a bit more like this. And go, you know, I don't really buy that. Mm. I don't buy that. It seems to be almost like that old fashioned idea that you know, if you. Do you remember when Classic FM started and mm-hmm. all the advertisers just went your your classic partner or or in your football programs, you know, the perfect them. your perfect legal team or let's score together. Or you know, think <laughs> look, you're just trying, you're just talking to people. That's just the medium. You know, you don't adjust mm. you don't adjust your personality because uh, of of the medium, yeah. Al- although obviously with something like Twitter, you don't have so much space. Well, but it's so interesting, right? And I'm just firing off all sorts of thoughts when you're talking about this. Comes up every day, and and we're spectacular, right? So, with our clients, they're saying we've got our brand voice, and then the advice a lot of the time is tweak it for social. Now, the interesting thing is. With what you've said, and, and I think the issue is, it's because of the amount you don't have to, but people say, so they post and post and post and post, and with brand personality, some t- you know it's seen as this perfect language, but on social because you're communicating so much, the enigma sort of falls slightly, mm-hmm. and y- you you know you. I think for you to write perfect tone of voice every single time would be a tough ask. I think what happens here is if you understand the key elements of your personality, mm-hmm. and that's why we were the first people, and I believe we're actually still the only people to measure this. Mm-hmm. Because how do you manage it if you can't measure it? Yeah. So we we measure tone of voice, and the way the way we do that is like taking a personality profile we Mm -hmm. listen to a a group of rivals to understand what the generic tone of voice is okay so what are we measuring it against and so we've got a business benchmark of 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 nearly two million words Mm -hmm. with 265 brands in across 32 different categories and so we take a group of rivals and and we'll, we'll extract the language from their websites which is really, you know, people say, why websites? Well, one, it's all publicly available. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and two, you know, it's the home of the brand conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and we put, that, we put that into our word geek robot, Bob. And he, he measures this stuff because he can do it much quicker than human beings can and objectively. And he'll pick up those things that, are, that, that human beings can't do. I mean, that, we invented him basically because people are such bad listeners yep. um, because there is such a volume of, of language to listen to. And you'll always have a, as much as you will or won't want to admit it, you'll always have a slight bias or agenda. Or, and I think that's what's so good about the AI stuff with Bob, that as you see, it's just facts. It's facts. People, you know, I, senior management absolutely love this stuff. Yeah. They absolutely love it. And, 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 Really good marketing people love it because they go, wow, we can measure this now. So we understand these, we, we measure what, what what makes the category different. And then all of this is bottom up. You know, mm. it's not this is not top down pattern matching like archetypes or everything. All we're doing is listening and finding out how consumers and brands are, are, are doing this stuff. And then we're able to say, look, here, here's the brands. 
here's each brand. So this this generic, here's the generic, and here's each brand, and how you're different, how your brand is mm. different to the generic. And it's uh, we're measuring things like egotism, empathy, you know, their social links, whether they're into family or leisure or work, whether they're problem solvers, answer finding finders, they're, they're how clearly. They're delivering their confidence and all of these sort of personal, their thinking styles, whether about action or, or quant or reasoning. Um, and so, so the level of sensory engagement and the sensory preferences that they're, that they're using so that we're able to say, look, OK, so we've got all of these measures. Now, you know, what does that mean? Are you is this delivering to your brand values? Because fundamentally, your personality and your tone of voice should be about your brand values. And we find the ones that are important. So when we did, uh, we did a load of work with Adidas on this. And um, when we are able to show them how, how unengaging their, their personality was to their, what was then looking to get back to their core teenage mm. audience, we were able to, to, to give them all of this information and then focus on just five key, really simple elements to up, weight their their personality and to, to be able to deliver that personality right across all media you know so you've got adidas they are you know very very impressive organization and when they put their mind to something and they put their their resources behind it they make this happen mm -hmm. and we were measuring it for for uh for on six monthly basis afterwards how they were delivering across all of their touch points and absolutely consistently their agencies were delivering to the tone of voice mm -hmm. that we helped them define so adidas is therefore delivering its values every euro it's spending is is being delivered some is delivering something consistently rather than talking against itself so it really helps deliver personality and it helps deliver it consistently mm -hmm. i think you know, th this is coming up a lot, by the way, in, in, in podcasts that are up now and, and ones that are coming, which is about this consistency and this, you know, everything being coming, being about the brand and coming from the brand. And what's really still surprising, and it's a tip for anyone listening to go and do this, you know, tomorrow, is go and look at where your company values are. And most of the time, a lot of the time, they're sitting with the HR department, Right. And then they've got it saying, you know, let's say it's a Mexican restaurant and our values spell salsa, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, and it, they've written the punchline before they've written the joke. And then they have to go serious, entertaining, did it or whatever it is, you know, mm, or, you know, mm. uh, you know, whatever it is. So you go through all that. Curious comes you up know, a lot. Yeah. All this kind of thing. And then it's nothing to do with the actual brand really so yeah. you've got so then the brand team marketing team have got their own values that's sitting over here and, and that alone being separated is is dangerous you're you're right mark there's a there's a real big all of this comes back to values uh, in terms of tone of voice in mm. particular uh, that personality and the problem is is the way there is a definite problem with the way companies are defining their values i would suggest to listeners that that if they're in control of this stuff is that they just go and ask members of staff what the brand values are and if you've got more than four then you're in deep trouble mm. and and what what do they stand for I, I, i'll tell you a great story actually about about a, a it's actually it's a it's a very well-known uh, food retailer in this country mm -hmm. and uh, and clothes to give you a, a, a which is not quite so successful and um, is there I, a prize if anyone guesses? I, was, I, I think, I think we've just given it away there. Uh, and interestingly, when we did the audit, the language on the food side was really exceptional, and and the cafes were full, and the food halls were full, and the language in the clothing area they were mute. There was virtually nothing. Mm. I don't think it's any surprise that where the sensory experiences were maximised, the business was successful. Yeah. But they had these internal values, and um, and and I got we got to do that that piece of work as a result of me sitting in a in a in a uh, a, a program that was put together a day's program put together by a big by a big media agency, and it's a really impressive day. And we we sat there, and I was listening to the, these people talk about purpose and so on. And the guy from the organisation who was responsible for the internal. Um, uh, 
for, for the CSR and all of the really important stuff, which you know they're very committed to, mm. was talking about we've got these four values. We have four values, and he named these four values, and he said only one of them's working. Only one of them's really sort of getting any any sort of traction. This one's working. And uh, that was the end. Of the, but by the time this, this thing had finished, it was fairly short. It was half an hour. So I went up to the group and uh, I said, really enjoyed the conversation. I'm prepared to bet 20 quid that I can name the one value that is working. And I named the value mm. and got the meeting and kept the 20 quid because I was right. And it was the only value that was not conceptual and was sensory. So I will give you some ideas of conceptual language that, that we all use in business, ideas like sustainability, mm. ideas like marketing, ideas like responsibility. You know, we use language that, that about loyalty, trust. All of these things are forcing our brains to work too hard. They are... System two front of brain. What on earth do these things mean? Mm. You know, when the big word, the big buzz word at the moment is purpose. You know, but this is so open to interpretation. When you're using sensory language, you know, the language of smell, you know, aroma, scent, fragrance, you know, stench. You know, the smell is very closely linked to disgust. Actually, you mm. know, so you can I smell a rat. You know, you or you know, the, you know this this I don't know this 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 meeting really stinks. Mm. You know, and and actually, our 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 sense of smell is so powerful because it 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 protects us from from taking something noxious. And it's and there's only one synapse between our senses uh, between our sense of smell and and the brain. So it's like a motorway into our into our brain. Whereas sight is much more complicated. So using words like you know, look, purple, view, vivid observe perspective you know squares so, so the language of your sight actually takes five synapses you know you've got you've got binocular vision it's got to be turned into color it's got to be turned the other way up so but you, but this language of, of of sound and touch and taste um is really really important because people it's we call these we call these body words right. you know our, we can i can make you hotter by starting to talk about sweatiness about uh, sultry you know we, you we always do this to me and i hate <laughs> it you're like some sort of darren brown character <laughs> but when you start doing this. <laughs> but we but but this is this is what we do as human beings and we do, we're using it all the time you know where food and drink brands are actually really good is using a lot of sensory language yeah and uh, Marks and Spencer's, for example, is astonishingly good at using sensory language on its food. And those ads became really, really famous. Have you watched you know? them back since lately? Yeah. We yeah. ended up, I don't know what we were doing. I think it was maybe like a brief or something. Like, oh, we want to be like M&S or something. So we had a look and it was kind of like watching your favourite kids cartoon years later. Like <laughs> you can see how like, it's dated quite badly. Yeah. And it's so blue movie. <laughs> <laughs> Should I tell you why? Yeah. But the reason the reason it's dated is actually, and this is the problem with sensory language, mm. is it's very difficult to own. Yeah, you know, it's difficult to own. You can't you can't say like M and S then started getting copied by everybody else. Okay, That's so what happens. so you can totally overdo it, mm. and and people do this all the time. Yeah. I mean, to, in food and drink, two of my least favourites are indulge and treat. You know, treat yourself, indulge. Mm. I.e., this is likely to this this could kill you yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. If you have you too fart, much. Yeah. So you have to be very careful about ensuring you don't you don't just pile the sensory language on. But the other thing is to be. It's interesting that taste is only we only ever come across taste as a sense in food and drink, but with with this whiskey project, for example, you go well. Taste is obviously going to be incredibly important, but you know if you've got a food product or a drink product, and that you know you, unless the people open the bottle in the in the supermarket or the off license and take a swig of it, mm. then. Taste is not going to come into the equation if they haven't tried it before. Yeah, true. You know, so we've discovered that sight, in in the study of the, of whiskey, sight is incredibly uh, important, mm -hmm. um, and and so is texture. In fact, there is a massive 
underlying sensory narrative in the making of malt whiskey, which is turning rough thing, roughness into smooth. So you see loads of um, rugged landscapes, rugged Scots guys like you, <laughs> banging rough tools to knock up casks and barrels. And then, then there's this sort of transformation, sensory transformation, as it goes into a smooth copper still, and then it comes into a bottle. And then the bottles quite often are embossed to give a sort of a sensory memory mm. of where it came from. And quite often you'll see the bottles are photographed against um, rough surfaces like a stone wall. Or Jack Daniels, for example, has lots of photographs against um, piles of charcoal. So there will be this external rough texture to emphasise the smoothness of what's inside. You know, and think about... The language that they use, hard liquor, yeah, you know, versus something smoother, and that sort of thing is massively important for malt whiskies, but it comes across blends as well. Mm -hmm. So these textual things are really, really important. Sensor sensory stimuli is really, really important. I think also, you know, when when we're thinking about whiskey things as well, you know, the 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 language and the visual merchandising and the sensory experience they have it, like duty free, for example. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, how do you know if you've not... It will, it's almost like buying a book for the way it looks on the shelf, you know, rather than, you know, you, you don't know if it's going to be any good or not. Yeah, and then know? the price point goes, are we yeah. are, are we going to go for this at all? So what's really important is 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 packaging. You know, because packaging gives you that opportunity to to have that conversation and to and to put something across about those, uh, yeah, what's inside. And... and I thought Goo did a fantastic job. You know, when, when, when I've got a cupboard full of glass <laughs> ramekins that I don't know what to do with. What what a great job they did. You know, they they what they what they the way that they deliver that their their personality was to turn the was to turn um, each product line into a person. So there was this great moment with a, when they were started to extend their product line where they went from the chocolate pudding, which was a goo chocolate pudding, to Fru. And it's and it said, oh, have you met my sister Fru? <laughs> you know, isn't that interesting? Yeah. People, we are absolute suckers as human beings yeah. for personifying things. Yeah. You know, we personify animals. You know, we personify inanimate objects. You know, the internet The internet was responsible for the Arab Spring. Well, it's an inanimate digital system, for yeah. heaven's sakes. You know, so... Yeah, we, we look at cars and go headlights and oh, and here's a, here's a smile because we, we we see these things. And as people used to call the cars sh her and she and have a name for it and yeah, absolutely, and him we, and whatever. Yeah, we're, so we're suckers for that. Mm. So it's that's another really good thing that you know that 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 food products can do. And I, another example, I, which I think is a, a company that does exceptionally well of delivering its tone of voice and a personality is Pret. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I mean, I was speaking at a neuroscience conference in Chicago last November and I found a Pret. And as a Brit, you go, thank God, you know, something fresh for breakfast that doesn't involve pancakes and syrup and all the rest of it. Although I love the dye in the breakfast as much as, as, as but, you know, you know, I'd eat something that's going to be fresh. And I was absolutely blown away by how well the brand personality was translated about how consistent it was about yeah. the how it was linked into their care for homeless people in mm. Chicago and where their food went in went the the mm. sensory language was great it was consistently de delivered you know right through every every single piece of writing was yeah. absolutely consistently delivered but there's a few things we pray and you know I was lucky enough to be there for you know for around a year and learn all this stuff and how they do it. Like I really, you know, really was just in to help, but also be a sponge and think, oh, how do these guys do it? So there's a couple of things about it. You know, one is they're actually under fire at the moment because the real bread company has taken them to the ASA because of the word uh, natural. Right. And there's, you know, some non-natural stuff that's going on in the bread and different things. So they might have to look to change that. And actually, it's such a core thing to the brand. So, you know, I hope it all works out and stuff. But again, it's that whole brand mm -hmm. promise thing. Um, but, you know, there's there's an article by Mark Ritson this week in Market and Week on it, and it's, you know, 
pretty strong stuff. He's, right. he's really went for the jugular. Um, but, you know, looking on the sunny side of the street and, and why it's so consistent, there's a few things. I mean, it's still the voice of Julian Metcalf, really, um, that they've managed to carry on. But there's a wonderful creative director in there called James Connell. And, you know, James is just second to none. Well, three cheers, because I, I, just as a consumer, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's lovely to hear this yeah. because it's very, very obvious for someone working in the in the area that we mm. do that it's just beautifully delivered no, no you know it just comes out the way he writes it so naturally you know ho, ho. but he, you know he does it just such a great job and there's a great creative team around him um there's a lot of guardians within the company that have been here for years and years that will you know make it right too so it's not just him alone but yep. you know he really leads the charge on that and then you know clive's living and, and breathing it every day but you know yeah they've, they've they just are Con- consistently consistent, you know, that's all you can say about them, and they've stuck to that forever, and they'll never so, stray. That is so important. You know, what happens, I think, a lot of agencies and brand people get bored of campaigns, or get bored of a, and, and want mm. to change things, but, you know, if consumers, if your customers are happy with who you are, and you try to change things, then yeah. that's crazy. You know, and I think one of one of the, th- the other things I would really advise listeners is never to try to be somebody else. Yeah, and this is a problem, right? We are so many briefs that we get. I want to be like Leon. I want to be like Itsu. I want to be like. Pret. Well, the best thing to do is go and buy them because <laughs> you know, I when when I first started on, you know, I was working. I was working. Uh, in the city is a in, in an investment management company, which sounds like it's a very glamorous thing, but it was it was known as the the investment was the slug of the city while all the exciting stuff was going on elsewhere. But it meant that we you know we had we we had uh, we had consumer markets to sell uh, to you know to help people prepare for retirement and to help their kids get through school and and and, and university and stuff. So you know it's important stuff, but. When when I first started there, the brief really from from the that was coming from above is that we wanted we should have been like the company that was number one, and uh, as a still a fair wet behind the ears sort of marketing graduate who'd only done about three years uh, work experience before then, and I said, well, you know, we're we're never going to be that other brand because they're so good at being it themselves. Mm. You know, we start from a different point. And this is what happens. If you are trying to be another brand and you are, want to sound like another brand, all you're going to do is sell that brand. Yeah. Or, or at best, you're going to be average. Mm. You know, this is why it's really important to a- absolutely understand. And we spend a lot of time listening to key people. Mm. You know, we, we we don't just work with big brands. We work with um, <clears throat> just we, we did a really interesting project last year, understanding what creativity was. You know, so we work with a learning and development company that does this amazing stuff. Um, Do you want to name check them? Yeah, they're called Art Gym and, mm. and they're an um, an absolutely amazing company that go in to people like Adidas, actually, mm. and, and Sony and, and big organisations. And and what they do is release the creativity inside people, which is those companies' greatest human resource. And that resource is something that we all have. Yeah. You know, we all have it. You have it. Okay, so I've just done the brand manifesto, which was which we came out. We understood what creativity was, and we did that by by listening to the team there, and and listening to their customers, both corporate and people that were working in mentoring, and uh, uh, and and leadership, and training people and smaller organisations themselves who who could then learn those tools from from art gym to understand how they were framing what creativity was and that's what it was okay so people who people who didn't understand creativity very much so we also interviewed members of the general public to see if there was any demand for this had a fairly simple definition of which came down to visual yeah. sense so they saw creativity as being something artistic yeah. whereas these people in these organizations and pe- individuals who run who, who who are who are mentors and trainers themselves actually perceived it as something of value. So this it's a resource that is locked inside mm-hmm. you, and then we discovered just by listening to them. That, so what happens when it comes 
when you bring out this creativity, it allows you to make connections that you couldn't make before. Okay, so we've got three frames. It's a resource. It's inside you. If you bring it out, it allows you to make connections you couldn't make before. And after we delivered this piece of work, there was a piece of... um, uh, there was some neuroscience study on creativity. Mm-hmm. And guess what? It showed that people who were more imaginative, so we're not talking about artistic stuff. You know, I'm not very artistic, but, you know, we, me and the team have created a robot that reads how people are thinking and feeling and their psychology. That's creative, okay? So this this study showed that people who are, have the imagination and greater levels of imagination and use that imagination because we all have it, mm-hmm. actually have better neural connections. So the whole... It was amazing. Yep. It was amazing. We were so delighted to realise... I think I remember when you cracked yeah. it, actually. So, you were dead chuffed. Oh, yeah. And to actually <laughs> discover that, yeah, the, the, to, that fundamental link between the neuroscience absolutely connecting to the way people yeah. were expressing themselves. And it's not a, an entire surprise because language is an expression of how we're thinking and feeling. So that's all we do. And, and also, um, Eugene and Chrissy over there, uh, we know really well at Art Gym, and they've just won a BAFTA, right? Yes, Yes, so, so it's creativity. Yeah. They're, they're no, it was it, it was it was the National Film Awards. The National Film Awards, sorry, it was that, was nas- it. that was it. National Film Awards. They because yeah. they did this, so they're really committed to making things happen, and they they um, they did a, a film it's about like a the mi- wasn't mi- it? a documentary on the migrants' journey. Yep, and you know, just to put this into context, listeners, this beat. Blue Planet 2 oh, to, to Best Documentary <laughs> at the National Film Awards about a month and a half ago. So, you know, if you do this stuff well, any company yeah. can any company yeah. can start to deliver. So never, ever try to be like anybody else because all you're going to do is sell for them. Well, there's a, there's a great phrase which is uh, you can't beat what you copy, you know? And if you look around, that that's why absolutely, by you know, Pret isn't getting beaten and, and all the rest of it. The other thing, just to say about Pret as well, actually, just back to that subject was the reason as well it's so consistent is that the core product offering all that is so good that they don't have to flog it. Yeah. So most other companies are promotion jockeys, and they're flogging their stuff. Mm-hmm. Whereas Pre opens the doors and welcomes people in, mostly, and, and along may that continue and stuff. But then you can use your resource and your attention and your creativity, to, to your point, on the the big stuff. And also, they are doing work six, nine, twelve months out. Yeah, They're so ahead of the game. And the trouble with the food and drink industry at large, under-resourced in the creative side of things, yep. you know, it's, it's, it's usually okay on ops and stuff, maybe. And yeah, you, you're up against it. You know, it's, I need this done by now. I need this done by tomorrow. And, he's, and it's just like, there's no, when you're marketing at the coalface and it's an inch away from you, you don't make good decisions. It's extraordinary. When I mean, we worked on a client together, didn't we, where mm. there was an issue with how the, the, this was a restaurant chain, and there was an issue with how people, how do you get people to, to deliver a consistent performance and if your listeners heard robert bean he was he he referenced a a a restaurant that he went to and said it was very clear that these people have been recruited Mm. on with a particular personality type but it's really really important if you're running a restaurant chain or you have any retail presence to absolutely fundamentally ensure that everybody who is face to face with your customers understands the personality of the organization understands how to talk to people and this isn't when you get this right this is a, the exact opposite of, of of messaging where people say you have to say this and you have to say that and and people are quite clearly uncomfortable mm. at, at going through things by rote so if you get it right it, it's actually it it's actually at the core. Listen, as I've got my hand on my chest here in a metaphorical um, expression to show that it's inside an organisation. This isn't something that can be bolted on from the outside because it'll be false. You know, I've often used the example, actually. You know, I 
particularly in America, when I'm talking in America, America at a conference, I, could, I often say to them, look, I could plausibly practice and put on a Scottish accent. Mm. And I might even, I might be able to fool you for a while mm. that I'm Scottish and I've got it, my name's Alastair. Okay, but as soon as I have a beer with a jock mate or I meet a proper Scot, I'm going to be found out. Mm. You know, I'm going to be found out. And it's extraordinary that brands are prepared to take that risk yeah. by pr- trying to pretend that there's something that they're not mm-hmm. or trying to pretend that they're another brand. Yeah. You know, focus on yourself, understand the the rivals and the context of so you don't just deliver what everybody else. So mm-hmm. I, well, we would always say you, you need to measure this. If you if we if if you can't find someone like us, you know, get people to just be very very get get the rivals websites and and print them out and stick them around your 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 meeting room and just become totally familiar with what they're saying start to highlight stuff mm. that you're going okay that with this these are some things look, look at the senses that they're using um listen out for those sort of those pictures those those frames i can tell you there's going to be there's going to be dozens and dozens and dozens mm-hmm. of them. Are they consistent? Yeah. You know, are they delivering this stuff consistently? And then familiarise yourself with that and bring in somebody from outside to to listen to you as a team. Never employ anybody who will just go and write. I mean, we've analysed millions and millions of business words. And on average, a business website, a brand website, is... 19% more difficult to read than the Financial Times. I remember you, you telling know? me that. 19% more 19% difficult. more difficult to read than the Financial Times. 58%, this is almost absolutely consistent, 58% of, of, the, of the ideas that make up people's propositions are generic. You know, now we say you can't, you, you need some anchoring generics. But people, so it should be the other way around. About mm. a third should be generic, and then you need to focus on your difference. So you, people are wasting money selling the same things that everybody else is selling. So, like, what would like come and have our delicious burgers or whatever? Well, yeah. If you, if you, 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 it might be you might be selling deliciousness. You might be selling freshness. You might be selling seasonal. You know, you understand what those terms are, mm. and and understand what everybody else is looking at start counting them please please start measuring these things mm-hmm. i mean it's very very quick and easy to do when you've got a robot if you haven't got a robot <clears throat> you can actually find some pretty easy Get one on amazon yeah you can you can <laughs> honestly you can find stuff which will extract the concepts yeah. of things you know so it doesn't take it doesn't take a lot but familiarize yourself and then put yourself in the you know get somebody to come in and listen to you Mm. Okay, really listen to you about what your company is about and 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 what you what what you want to do and and we ask only about six or seven questions when we're listening to people in in organizations and I'll tell you the one that we end with we sort of wind it all up and then we go okay right that's that's it and just to sort of wind it up you know why should anybody care and and you've got to be brave as a consultant to ask that it's because it can cheese people off. It's a, you know? no, actually, by that stage, by that stage, people have absolutely loved being listened to. Right, nothing okay. more do so they love permission. than being listened to. Yeah, and we we did this with people like you know Eugene and Chrissy, and this is before we we won the pleasure of working with them, mm. and I was able to use that those interviews to 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 echo back their language. And, and the way that they framed mm-hmm. what they were doing. There was lots of stuff about rippling. And, you know, I started mm-hmm. to use that language because immediately, and it wasn't manipulative. We yeah. understood by listening. I understood how they were framing their business and what they wanted to achieve and yeah, how yeah. they wanted to do that. So that made us a perfect fit because we were prepared to listen. And why should anybody care is a question that every single person listening to this podcast who has a business or is responsible for spend should ask that question Mm -hmm. should ask that question you know and that does come down to purpose but it's one of those really important things about okay why so so what are you doing that's different and and so why should anybody care about us it's because 
and what and what we do is because we are on a single minded mission to make business better listeners yeah okay and and business but making business better listeners is going to make people happier it's going to have happier customers we're not going to have to listen to this drivel and tedium that that we're going to have to that we have to listen to there's going to be much happier people working for those organizations they're going to be more robust you know we want to see businesses succeed i yeah. love businesses and i absolutely love brands the reality is about many copywriters that they're ambivalent mm. about brands they feel that they are they are manipulating people. I just I don't believe people can be manipulated. I just really fundamentally don't believe that. There are way too many dead brands and dying brands to believe that you can make people buy something. You can't. Mm. You absolutely can't do that. But many copywriters would rather be writing their novel or their or, or doing their creative writing. You know, not that I'm decrying that. Yeah, but it depends where your priorities are, and we absolutely we know lots of fabulous copywriters, mm. really, really good writers mm. who are very happy to get the sort of briefs that we put together because it gives them the freedom and the creativity, and it focuses agencies on very, very clear areas so that they don't deliver generic, so they have happier mm. clients, and it allows them to get their creative juices running. So this this. This breakfast piece that we've just done, you know, we've discovered that breakfast is is all about containers. You know, so breakfast cereal is the subject matter, and we've discovered the importance of containers. So if you think about it, you've got with with a breakfast cereal, it is inside a container. Then it goes, th- then it contains various other things like nutritious things about proteins and people are framing what's about what's inside yeah. what's inside this this breakfast yeah okay and then it's inside a family unit okay and it goes inside you so people even talking about filling you know mm. you fill a container so the, the breakfast is in a container. The, it's a container of of, of, nutri- of things that are nutritious or not nutritious, and of and of values that goes inside you, mm. and you are part of a family. Right. Okay. So the container metaphor and it frame is incredibly important mm-hmm. to understand for for breakfast. And the reason that we showed an ad that they run, and it. To so to show that it was the ad was a was a clever ad. It was all about making tough decisions, mm. and there was a variant of this cereal. So very so we've got the standard, and then now we've got a new variant of the cereal. Right. So they run this they run this ad which shows a woman, mm. a bride, at the point of being asked to say "I will" or "I do." And she cannot get it out. And she's looking around. And the family members are getting scared. She's looking at the exit sign. They actually show the exit sign. And then at the end, it goes, wow, we all have tough decisions to make. Because now you've got to decide. But now you can choose this or this. Okay, now we could. Now, if you understand it's about containers. Yeah. Then you're going, that was an absolute disaster of an ad. She is inside a church looking to go inside a family yeah. she's re- looking towards the exit she's trying to get out of the container she's rejecting the family she's rejecting the children that are so important to this brand not wanting to make a commitment to this guy yeah. to have children the family are are looking at one another she doesn't want to put to be part of us and then at the end it says tough decisions and what is the sensory issue about this brand it's tough and dry. Uh, so by saying tough decisions, they've signaled the worst sensory aspect, the weakest sensory aspect of this particular brand. Yeah. And by by rejecting what having this woman wanting to get out of the container mm. and not make a commitment to the family, the fundamental values mm. of what that breakfast is about mm. is, is being rejected. So... But they wouldn't know that if they they didn't know that no, they didn't before know we did before we did that listening. Right, let's try something brave then. Let's riff it right now. What should they have done? 
So if it's all about containers, what what could it have been? Well, I I tell you what I've got I've got it. Okay, Go well, I've I've got it. Two children that are standing on a touchline, okay, and they're talking about their their mums or their dads, okay. But I want it to be their mums on this one. They're talking and they're saying. You know, she's 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 got loads of energy, hasn't she? Yeah, 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 yeah. She's got, she's got loads of energy. Yeah, she keeps going. Yeah, 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 yeah. My mum keeps going. She, I mean, she's she's amazing. She's got she's got all of this energy. She's going, and then it goes. It zooms up. She scores a goal, right? So she's playing football. football. This is North America, so I'm, but I'm not going to use the S word. And <laughs> so uh, she, she's 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 played football. She scores, right? She gets the. She's part of a team. The, the teammates come on. I would even maybe even have the dad coming coming on to give her a kiss to show how proud it is. And then she, he turns to his, to, to his mate and said, "You know, she's a brand name mum. Right. I make sure she goes out full every day, right? And so you turn it around and you have the kids, you have the kids looking after the parents, right? right? And as part of that family unit, because the big thing is to take that family unit out." There's a, there was a lot of stuff in the research that came out that showed that these people were actively engaged in the container of their community. Right. Okay, so outside active stuff. And that this, the underlying thing here would be the, this, would, this is an active family. It's the antidote to the, to the kids being screened up all the time. Although you should never say that. But, you know, we're, we're, we're as a family, we're together mm. and, and we have, so I, I get, I get, um, validated as a parent and we as a family get validated by the community around us you know we're successful we're accepted and we're all a unit we're all yeah. together that's how i do it and i just make it funny with the kids looking after the parents nice nice and is that actually ha- happening you're doing this Maybe? no no the research the, the, actually the debrief was on wednesday ah. the debrief was on wednesday so we've not heard back with this is with uh, with a with a partner agency in canada very so cool. I'm looking forward to hear, to hearing back, but I know that it's gone down incredibly well. Yeah, yeah. I know that this these psychological insights, which mm-hmm. have been taking a part, taking part across, you know, a num- we were involved in the in the research design, and there were you know a number of different families involved, and there were lots. There were there were online activities and video yeah. diaries, and lots of ways for them to express themselves. You see, this is the other thing we absolutely love, Mark. Most researchers hate people talking. Mm. So they force people into a structure of research that is convenient for them. Right. And that's because free text is such a pain for them because they have to read it. And they don't really fully understand what's happening. So we call this the listening gap. So the, the neuroscience is clear. Mm-hmm. The more people talk, the more they reveal of themselves. So you want people to talk yeah. and we want to listen right but listening uh, if you've got to go through this i mean we bob analyzed something like 180,000 words which is uh, about half the size of war and peace right now actually that's not true it's a quarter of the size let me put that into context it would be about seven shakespeare plays okay it, it takes days to read this yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. But when you've got a robot that does it, it takes minutes. Okay, he reads 120 times faster than we do. We don't actually ever read it until he shows us the things to go and look at. He benchmarks it all and says, listen, you want to go and have a look at this. Yep. Look at this container stuff. You know, there's something happening about container stuff. And look, you can see here, people want a better breakfast. isn't? They? they don't want, the tradition thing isn't so big. Clearly, that's big in whiskey, right? Yeah. So he's showing you these things. So it makes it very quick and easy mm-hmm. for us to do. So we call this the listening gap. Mm-hmm. You've got researchers forcing people into structures that make it easy for them because it's difficult to listen. So that's why Bob comes in to close that listening gap. Yeah. Let them talk. And this is done so fast and so quickly now. And this is where... 
robots are really, really useful mm. and valuable because actually he's doing something that people can't do. And then it, there's loads of value added. Mm. You know, he's enhancing what we do. He's mm. adding value to the research team. He's not replacing them. He's, off, he's adding apps, you know, incredible insights and additional value and, and sort of outlining things that they can start to colour in. You know, and that enables research agencies. Mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of direct client stuff and we have a lot of partners. It allows people to, to have deliverable outcomes. Not here's an interesting out here's, here's an interesting insight, yeah. which in, incidentally is a visual idea, yeah, an insight. Yeah. You know, we actually think what we do is is deliver connections. You know, we allow which is which is a connections is is a is a picture word. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we 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 make those connections, and every single time there is a deliverable outcome. It says, look, this is the way you want to talk to these people, yeah. and that doesn't just involve. The language it involves the visuals as well. Mm. And one thing I meant to ask you about as well was wackaging. Um, any thoughts? Uh, who's doing it well? Who's doing it bad? Has it jumped the shark? All that sort of. Well, jazz? I think I think this kind of, this comes back to the to the, the sort of the innocent cliche. Mm. You know, we want to sound like innocent. Well, innocent. We've already just we've already discussed why you shouldn't sound like another yeah. brand. Innocent does a very good job at being innocent, and three cheers for them. I think there's been there's been a move over over uh, over several decades f in this country to become less formal, mm. which I personally believe is a very good thing. Yeah. You know, we become much less much less uptight and much more relaxed and and much more outgoing, and I think the country's a lot happier for it. And actually, when I was working for an investment company i spent a lot of time mm -hmm. writing language copy that was conversational and i'd have you know i'm i'm a state school boy comprehensive lad from down the just down the coast and and these i'd have i'd have a lot of you know at that stage there were a lot of blue bloods telling me you can't start the sentence with a conjunction yeah. you know and all this sort of stuff and i'd go well I, I, you know, I used to have a copy of the Bible there for that sort of stuff. And I'd go, and on the first day, yeah. and on the second day. And I'd say, look, if it's all right for God, you know, I think it's all right for us. And Was it in what wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you're sitting there going, look, you know, we've got to talk in the language. of uh, that, that stage, it was all very Daily Telegraph. I took, I took these investment products into the mail and into the, into the Express. And, 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 and I earned them a lot of money by, by, by positioning stuff well mm -hmm. and, 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 and resisting that stuff. So I'm, I'm a big fan of things of, of things being casual and you know I, i'm one of the we, i'm not we, we are pres we are descriptivists when it comes to language mm -hmm. you know there's a great another book your, your listeners might be interested in is called language wars by henry hitchings mm -hmm. um which shows that all of this stuff about you know gram various grammars and all the rest of it are just you know it's all about social status and all about national identity yeah. you know i've never known so many people get so worked up about the word decimate yeah. oh did you actually know it's one of, you know they'll tell you what it is yeah. you know they go well you know language develops and that was that was 2000 years ago yeah. or 1500 yeah it was it was 2000 years ago when the romans were were killing one person in 10 yeah. you know language moves jargon was a word that used to mean the twitter of birds. We all know that the word... Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Huh. We, we all know that the word gay is used in an entirely different concept mm. now. We see the word like social morphing in front of us mm. to mean something different. So people get sort of really worked up about this stuff. So we are not people that get worked up about that. I don't care if people say airplane or aeroplane. Mm. You know, because because the meaning is coming across. I don't care that people say train station rather than railway station. They've taken they've taken a consonant out. You know, I don't get worked up about that stuff, but a lot of people do. I mean, some things irk me. Mm. You know, a tradition that's going to start tomorrow. But I try not to get irked about this stuff. But I do get a bit a bit whacked about wackaging simply because it's so prevalent. It's boring. Mm. You know, it's just boring and what it is again is it's commoditized people yeah. think they're being different you know and people going 
you know, you've got to really think about where your brand is and what your brand is about. Do you want to be everybody's best mate? Yeah. You know, and 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 how are you going to stand out? Just being being wacky because everybody's being wacky means you aren't being yeah, wacky. Everyth- You're just being ordinary. Yeah, if everything's because, in bold yeah. and shouting, then yeah. no one's winning. Absolutely. You could you can maybe do better by whispering. Yeah. You know, you could maybe do better by being formal. Do you remember those brilliant Phileas Fogg ads? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how jolly that was. Yeah. So, I mean, Fever Tree, uh, not Fever Tree, um, uh, it was that great ginger beer brand. Fin- Fentiman's. Mm, yeah. You know, that sort of, that's rather, that, that's nice and jolly. And there's some... Curiosity Cola and yeah, all that sort of jazz. There's, there's, some, there's some really nice things being done yeah. there. And, it's, and if it's done with charm, mm. and if it's done... W- um, with your with you know with your your tongue firmly <laughs> held you know you go yeah. you know with a bit of cheek there's nothing wrong with that there's yeah. nothing wrong with that but again i think just being wacky for the sake of it i mean it's just it's 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 just like being in a room full of clowns yeah, yeah you know yeah. it get it gets tiring Definitely. it just gets tiring and maybe give people a rest and they, you know maybe this restaurant thing where they, you go into restaurants and and you know, so hey, you're all right, guys, and you know, and, and they're all they're your best mates straight away. I mean, is that really where you want to be? Mm. You know, do you want to come across as everybody's best mate? Yeah, you know. So think about how your people behave, think about your personality, and deliver something that that is consistent with that. Cool. I was just looking a wee eye on the time, and um, we'll probably get booted out soon. <laughs> um, but I was, I was just going to wrap up with a couple of things then. So, just you know, we're really trying to bring a bit of practicality and, and, and value to you know anyone that's listening. So, just to kind of summarise, then, if you're starting on your tone of voice journey, or you're sort of rebooting, or you know any of these things, what's the sort of main, you know? quick top tips then in terms of a process the the quick top tips are get understand how it fits in with your rivals Mm. but most of all understand yourself (coughs) excuse me you know understand yourself and and what you stand for look at those values you Mm. know do they really stack up you know and if somebody comes in and says oh you're a friendly brand or you're an approachable brand ask them what does that mean Mm. and what does it sound like Mm. You know, what does that sound like? And think about how you deliver it in all of the senses. How would we deliver that in terms of our behavior in front of our customer? What, what, does that, what would that mean in the way that we looked? What does that mean in the way that we'd sound? So I would take that idea about personality for Tone of Voice to just run through who you are as a brand. You know, ask your people, listen to them really listen to them you know bring in somebody to to mediate and and help you help you bring out who you are we Mm. often use a lot of visual material to help people build landscapes create landscapes Mm. visual landscapes and verbal landscapes of of what they stand for you know and we bring people from outside to help us. Mm-hmm. And we're bloody good at this. Mm-hmm. But we bring people to help us because we're all too close to our own companies. Yeah, You know, for years we got it wrong because we were selling voice. Yeah, Now we're selling listening and we're doing really well. Mm. You know, sometimes you just be prepared to show, but to admit you got something wrong. Yeah, you know, Be prepared to, to say, okay, what is absolutely fundamental to us and what's, superficial Mm -hmm. and try to lose the superficial stuff because keep it simple really keep it simple none of this stuff is complicated so just go simple brilliant wow that's been an amazing bunch of insight and advice and knowledge shared so mr alistair herbert thank you so much for spending the morning with me in the amazing brighton open market it's been lots of action out the window has been going on behind you, which has been fun. <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm a Brighton bloke and I've seen how this has changed. Yeah, yeah. There used to be food retailers here and now there's cafes and, yes. and there's booksellers. Yeah. You know, there used to be butchers here. There used to be fruit fruit and veg stalls. Yeah. And look how that's changed. And the world is changing fast. Yeah. You know, so to keep keep moving, everybody. Definitely. Keep moving and keep listening. Definitely. Thank you so much, Alistair. It's been and a yeah, have a great day. Cheers, man. 
Thanks so much to Alistair Herbert, founder of Lingua Brand, for coming in to talk to us all about tone of voice and also, more importantly, listening today in the Spectacular Marketing Podcast. Do check out linguabrand.com for anything that you might want to talk to Alistair about to help your brand stand out from the crowd. Please rate, review, share and subscribe to the Spectacular Marketing Podcast. Thanks for those of you who have been listening in the last few weeks. We've managed to chart, which is great news and very exciting. Thanks also to the exec production team, Gabby, Mahal and Gaz for all of their hard work in putting this together. I'm Mark McCulloch and this was Spectacular. Spectacular.